Uh, if you guys don't know who I am, um, <laughs> <laughs> I did not mean that. <laughs> oh my god. Um, so I work at one of the the best collections in the entire world, the Dela Cruz collection, and look who came through the freaking door. It's the energy. Come on now. Don't niggle. <laughs> of course. <laughs> oh my God. That's family right there. That is definitely family. Um, so yeah, so I worked at the Dela Cruz collection, uh, one of the, the best collections in the world, really, in my opinion. Not because I work there, um, but just in general. Um, so I was an intern that was, uh, I interned at the, at the time um, at the Dela Cruz Collection during Art Basel. And I was invited by the actual the director uh, from the Dela Cruz and from Rosa Dela Cruz herself to work there during um, 2019's um, Art Basel. And um, I, my station was, I said station, well my space in the collection was at the Rasheed Johnson room. And I knew that room from the back of my hand. And I literally like had a whole conversation with Mashani, who else was there? Uh, um, Amani. Amani. I think Ambrose might have been there. Oh, I think it was Amani, Lewis, and I think Ambrose, um, Murray was there. I think. I don't remember who else. I don't know if Joe was. I don't think Joe was there. Actually, I think Joan Najan was there as well, because you also know her as well. Yeah. My bestie. <laughs> and <laughs> um. So, yeah, so I captivated them with <laughs> um, about the Rasheed Johnson room. Um, Rasheed Johnson's work is amazing. So if you guys are in the Miami area, please check out the Delphi's collection. Um, and please look at Rasheed Johnson, life-changing. Um, but yeah, so Maj Majani was there. We talked a bit. Um, and it was like casual, OK, hey, hey, Instagram, what's up? Like. <laughs> And then um, fast forward to 2021. Wow, yeah, it's been it's been a while. It's been a break. Oh my god. Okay, so fast forward 2021. <laughs> she's um, at residency at the Fountainhead Residency here in Miami, Florida, and um, she comes upstairs. And I was like, Marshani, oh my god. And it was so crazy. Guess who I was talking to that day? Marlon. The photographer in New York. Really? We FaceTime him. Remember? I feel. Oh my God! I feel like we did. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a mutual friend, uh, Marlon, and shout out to you. Um, so Marlon, um, I was in. Marlon? Yes. <laughs> Okay, I have to I have to give you a disclaimer. Um, so, I have a best friend here. Her name is Amber Rush. Um, every one day, she fried uh, frozen corn dogs in the house, and ever since then, my eyes have been super sensitive. And so, you guys think I'm crying? No, my eyes are just really sensitive like that. No, for, for real. For real. <laughs> <laughs> so I, apo I apologize. So um, hopefully you guys take this moment. It's, like, it's so serious because it is. <laughs> so thank you, Amber, for a dying, um, for making my eyes so sensitive to the, my environment. Um, <laughs> 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 but yeah, so the so that is the first time we met. It was 2019 at uh, Art Basel um, at the Dela Cruz collection. Yeah, and then so ever since then, like, how do you feel like life has developed for you? Hmm. That is a very broad question. Um, I feel like in 2019, my life was changing in a way that 
I felt like was going downhill and I felt like I needed to make a change um, because I wanted better for myself. Um, and I, do I dove more into my art. I've been making art since I was like young. Like I've been drawing since second grade. I've been working in clay since eighth grade. And I've always taken it seriously, but I think like, I'm an Aquarius y'all. So when things piss me off, it fuels my fire. And I'm just gonna like, you know what? I'm gonna be the best person ever. You know? <laughs> so um, I just kind of dove deeper into my art and really started making things more personal. Um, I ended up going to Fountainhead in 2021. Obviously, we talked about that. And um, I ended up doing other residencies. Like, I was at the Creative Alliance residency in Baltimore, Maryland. That was a three-year residency in the live-in studio situation. And then I was also at the Alma Lewis residency, which is in Pittsburgh, founded by Kilolo Luckett. We love Kilolo. Shout out to Kilolo. And I just came <laughs> from a residency at uh, the Penland School of Craft, and that is with, um, Penland School of Craft was pairing with um, an institution called Better Together and Crafting for the Future, and it's really about um, bringing black artists and gra black creators to spaces where we feel like we have no connection to or we feel like we can't be there, right? So, you know, the area of North Carolina we were in was very, you know, very white. <laughs> and I feel like in places like that, we don't, we either don't know about them or we feel like we're not welcome. When, and this program kind of teaches us to, like puts us in places where we're with each other and we're like-minded. So there were glass blowers and ceramicists and um, 12 of us. And we all just kind of worked together, bonded together, met other people, and but met each other in a space where we felt comfortable enough to branch out because we see people who look like us. Does that, does that make sense? So first of all, there's a lot to unpack Sorry. after you <laughs> <laughs> after you said that. Um, but that that really ties into uh, your work, you know, because you were in a space where maybe people that look like us um, may feel uncomfortable with or feel like we're not accepted or maybe we take up too much space or too little space, we dim our light or, or so, you know, just having those conversations with our, in our side, our heads. But with your work, you know, you're a contemporary artist um, who's been in many different spaces. Um, and with your work, obviously, it's a representation of people who look like you, right? So how do you feel when your work is in different spaces that you may be even unfamiliar with. Hmm. So that's so funny because the reason why I sculpted the way that I started sculpting and the whole format of it, it started when I was, it started when? <laughs> it started when I was in like, what was it? Like ninth or 10th grade and I was just like, you know, I'm tired of seeing only white people in museums and I'm also tired, no offense to people, but I'm also tired of like, um, only seeing artwork that showed our struggle. And although I really feel like we need to understand our history and really learn from it, I also feel like there needs to be some part of art somewhere that brings us joy and makes us feel like we're represented in a way that makes us proud, you know? Not that our history didn't make us proud. Obviously, I'm proud to be black. But <laughs> I also feel like um, I wanted to bring more of a joyous aspect to things. So. When I, when I mean format of my sculpture, I mean like the cut off shoulders and the elongated necks and just the bust. I wanted to replicate, though it came from replicating the sculptures in museums. But now I feel like I've been showing in places like the BMA or the Walters Museum in Baltimore. And those are the museums that I've seen growing up, but now showing sculptures that look like us or like resemble us, it gives me, I guess, a sense of peace knowing that the little, a little girl can walk in and see themselves and feel proud to be in the museum and know that they're beautiful because I, so that's something that I did not grow up with and that was hard. That's really interesting because I just, I think we're, as people, um, we're so used to uh, beauty being defined by a European standard, right? Um, but in your own opinion, what is black beauty? 
So, oh. Hmm. <laughs> so, black beauty for me is something that I've been learning over time and working through my own insecurities and realizing, I feel like this question is gonna be, this answer's gonna be so long, I feel like, so please interrupt me whenever you feel. Um, but I feel like black beauty comes from your own self-love and how you decide to, uh, decide to present yourself. So a little background story, y'all. I used to have like an afro, like growing up, I used to have like you, twists. Whatever. I had hair, okay? <laughs> I was not always bald-headed, okay? <laughs> No, go ahead. Cord Cordell, give Gordy. Corday, I'm so sorry. Oh my God. Yeah, well. Give Gordy Goldilocks her hair. We were, we were, we were at, um, just a joke, we were at, um, where were we at today for pastime. breakfast? Pastime? Past yeah. We were at pastime today for breakfast and we were just eating peacefully, right? <laughs> and this guy walks up to us and he was like, hey, how you doing? And then my, my boyfriend back there, he was like, hey, how you doing? And the guy was like, Papa Bear, give Goldilocks back her hair. <laughs> and then they just started dying laughing. And I was like, what? <laughs> that's why. That, that, was a, that was the story. But um, when, I was, when I was in college, so I had like hair. I had little fros. I used to do people's hair. I used to do natural hair treatments and stuff like that. And after a while, I just didn't feel connected with my hair. I feel like I kept my hair for everybody else. And I didn't feel like I kept it for me. And I felt like hair, especially for black people, hair adds to our character, especially when you do what you want with your hair, right? And I just felt disconnected. And one day, I went to my mom, and I was like, I want to cut my hair. And she was like, no, I work so hard. But I think she also realized that it's like, I, I was probably like a sophomore in college. Yeah. And she was like, I work so hard, and yada, yada, yada. And I think after that, she realized, like, you know what? Like, I'm not, I think she realized that I wasn't happy in where I was. And she sat me down in the bathroom, and she took scissors and started cutting my hair. She was cutting my hair with an attitude though, okay? <laughs> she had an attitude, but she was like, you wanna cut your hair? Fine, like, <laughs> but it was, it was, she knew that it was something that I wanted, you know? And um, she was actually the first person to cut my hair and then I'm going to the barber, but my hair just got shorter and shorter after time and now I'm like, I only have like three centimeters or half a centimeter of hair. But um, when I cut my hair, I felt this overwhelming sense of like confidence and I felt like, I forced myself to love myself for who I was and not hide behind my hair. Um, I was really insecure about my features. I was really insecure about like, just like little rant. Everybody has like little insecurities about themselves, but I feel like they were taking over me. And I, um, now I can't really hide behind them. I have to live in them, you know? And after a while, I'm just kind of like, you know what, like I'm her, like it's fine. <laughs> um, but what did you say? What is black? Thank you. <laughs> what is black? Thank you. What does black beauty mean? And I think that living in your truth is real black beauty. Um, but what does it mean for you? <laughs> so I was not ready for that. Um, <laughs> so I believe in unconditional love. Uh, so unconditionally, I believe that uh, beauty. Is um, is a beautiful story uh, that that embodies um, that embodies the the dark and the light of th certain things. So beauty to me um, is something uh, that's a journey, something that you can look forward to and look back on. Um, I think I think what um, black beauty has uh, become over time is acceptance. Mm. Um, acceptance and just genuine love for yourself. Mm. And like I said, something that you can look back on and something that you look forward to. So black love to me is like looking back at your past that made you who you are and loving every minute of it. Mm. The good, the bad, the ugly and then saying, I'm at this moment because of who I am and what made me who I am and 
now that I'm centered, I can look forward to all the things I ever wanted to do. So the next time y'all see me, y'all probably will see me with pink hair. So I don't know. I don't know. But yeah. But yeah, I just think um, black beauty is the realization that you are beautiful. Mm. It's, the real, it's like realizing, oh my God, I'm here. I'm a human being and I made it, you know? Yeah. So, because I always feel like my ancestors, my parents, all grandparents, all well, everything that they have experienced allowed me to be here in this moment. Mm. And I feel like everybody's story is, is unique, um, no matter what. Um, and we all share similar feelings, um, which is great. You know, that's what makes us um, connected. It's because if you feel sad, I feel sad. Just because it's a different reason, it's still sadness. Mm -hmm. So, or, I, I'm sorry I said sadness, but like happiness, it's the same thing. Like, it's a, it's a feeling that we have. And when you feel, confident on in the the person that you are and everything that made you who you are like i said i'm repeating myself again but whatever made you who you are love it and i think oh sorry <laughs> i think that um even in my own work i feel like before i was talking about self love in a way that was outward meaning like i was talking about things that were like, I'm making this for everybody else, which my work is for black people, but I'm making this for you, I'm making this for you. And I feel like recently I've come into a stage where I'm kind of like, I'm making work for myself now. My work is becoming more like reflections on how I feel, but I'm also learning to acknowledge how I feel, which is why my work has been turning into that. Um, and I think that's also a part of self-love because you have to listen to self in order to realize what self wants and what self needs in the moment. That's, a, that's really beautiful. <laughs> Honestly, especially um, when people see your work, um, the energy is, all, energy is never created or destroyed, but when you transfer, transfer your energy towards your pieces and having that mindset, um, I think that um, when people acquire your work, I think that the feeling is shared you know, they understand um, what it means to be you. Mm. And if you're not yourself when you're creating your work, you know, that, that the transition of, um, or that transaction becomes uh, distorted mm. in a way. So the fact that you sat here on this couch with me, <laughs> that you put, your, you put yourself in your work is amazing. And I just think that as any artist, um, should note that honestly, you know, like putting your work inside, putting yourself inside of your work, is the one of the most selfless things you can do because mm -hmm. it be it, it's bigger than at that point it's bigger than you, you know, mm -hmm. because every time someone sees that that work, is a part of you, and you know, so. I think it's um also sorry. I think it's also um, like a big vulnerability aspect to it as well, like learning to be vulnerable has been one of my hardest, like one of the hard, that and letting go of control, you know, and realizing that my feelings and control are kind of, they go hand in hand a little bit, where I feel like I have to control the outcome of things. But in losing control, I learned to be more vulnerable, if that makes sense. You know, I learned to just kind of let things be how they are and know that that's okay, but also understand that my feelings are also valid in that moment. Um, that's, no, it's okay. Um, I had like a really interesting, um, Instagram, uh, Facebook post saying about feeling, being feelings are being valid and how is a choice that we have to make when we move with our feelings, but move with facts. Um, so in, in your, your work, right. Um, being a full-time artist has facts ever gotten away with you creating? Meaning like when you look at your environment um, and you see, well, I feel like what most people relate to being a full-time artist is money. 
say you don't have like the money that you imagine to have to buy the materials that you want or to the time to to create and things like that when you're in those situations of like oh my reality versus your dreams where how do you how what is the next step for you in that moment where you're looking at your what's around you and it doesn't seem favorable and but you have a vision in your mind how do you get closer to the the vision and away from the reality that is a great question um i think that being a full, well, I've been full time for a couple of years now, maybe about like four or five, four years, five years. And I feel like I've learned a lot when it comes to creating balance, right? And understanding that although money is, yes, I gotta pay my bills and I'm gonna pay my bills, right? But also understanding that money is not the angle. Money is not the angle for me. Um, I'm still trying to figure out what exactly that angle is because it's many different things but it's not to get money, you know what I mean? It's really to understand myself more. Um, and I feel like, obviously, you know, pay your bills, you know, sell certain things to make your bread. But at the same time, I do save time to let myself be creative. Because <clears throat> how am I gonna grow as an artist if I don't allow myself the space to, do what I want to do and just experiment and mess up. And, you know, I even tried, I even started to change my language. Like the, the idea of failure to me is no longer failure. It's learning lessons always. So even in, I'm going to bring up the residency again because I just came from it, right? <laughs> even the residency, I messed up a lot, right? And I also tried different things because I'm in the space too. Um, yeah, even like these pieces, if you don't mind me talking, but even these pieces were not supposed to be like charcoal color. I love the color, right? <laughs> but they weren't supposed to be this way. They were supposed to be like a brownish, tannish, whatever. But I, um, that was also an idea of letting go and control. Usually when you put things in the kiln, you don't really know what happens to it. It might turn purple, it might turn green, it might blow up, it might stick to the kiln. Like you don't really know what's gonna happen. Um, which is a little nerve wracking, but it's also letting go of all of that. Um, but as far as balancing, I've learned to money manage over time. I, I'll get, um, if I sell something, I'll put things where they need to be, do savings, because you never know one month might be good and one month might be bad. So you have to learn how to like money manage and just because you see a number in your account doesn't mean you buying bottles for everybody, even though I would love to, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just that you have to learn like, hey, I gotta have a studio, I gotta pay my bills, I gotta eat, you know? But um, also putting aside some money for you to be able to mess up and learn um, and not make the same thing over and over and over again. I feel like when I keep making the same thing over and over again, I kind of get bored. I get bored really easily. Like I said, I'm an Aquarius. I get bored really easily. So I'm just like, hmm, I wonder, I have a lot of... Because <laughs> we represent for the Aquarius. I love Aquarians, though. We, we're amazing. I think so. No, I do. I really think we're amazing. Like... <laughs> We, <laughs> but I, I, I just kind of give myself space to I, money manage. To answer your question, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I really do want to talk about these pieces because um, she. So Mashani just came from a, a residency. Um, she actually just created these pieces. <gasps> Sorry. Yeah, go get her, please. Sorry. Um, but yeah, so Rajani just created these pieces at our art residency. Um, for the people that's in the space right now, they can literally smell these pieces. And it's, it's super fresh, super fresh. So amazing, so I'm really honored that we have them right now because we're the first people to ever see them. Yes. 
So that is an honor in itself. <laughs> um, and I'm just so, super grateful to have these pieces. Can you tell us like the, the technique, the, the different uh, format that you use to create these ind individual pieces? Absolutely. So um, while I was at the residency, um, they had two different types of kilns. Well, they had three different types. They had an electric kiln, which is what I usually use at home. They had a salt and soda fire kiln, which is you throw chemicals into the kiln, into the fire, and then it does a cute like gloss or whatever. Then there's a raku firing where you throw it in like a like something that burns, like um, sawdust, and then you burn it on fire. And then it, it's a lot of fire. It's a lot of fire going on, right? And so um, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try all of it. Why not? I'm at residency and I'm gonna explore, right? So this one, as I told you before, it was supposed to be more of a brownish color, but um, the clay that I use is called a dark brown clay. It's called 266 slash, I also use a 710, which is the same thing, but a little more like grog for sculptures. Um, and when you fire them all the way up to like 2200 degrees, which is called a cone six, um, in ceramics terms, it turns dark, dark brown. Well, There's a cone one. So there's a degree. So there's zeros here and well, zeros here. <laughs> and then you have one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to 11, technically. And then zeros back here. And then you have 01, 03, 04. So, oh, so, so it's kind of like negative, like but it's just a but, lower degree. But, but the degree is meaning like temperature? Yes. Okay. Yes. It's just a lower degree. So it's like, like, 018 would be maybe a thousand degrees, and then cone six would be like 2200 so degrees. Tell us, what's the difference between having a lower degree and a higher degree? It depends on what clay you're using, it depends on the glaze, it depends on what reaction you're trying to get out, you know? So these were both, this was fired to a cone six, 2200 degrees, and then as a bis. Well, sorry. Rewind. It was fired at 2200 degrees for a soda, a soda and salt firing. And that essentially means that you put it into this brick kiln and um, you fire it up to cone five, which is like 2100 degrees. And you um, throw soda ash and water in it. Soda ash is a chemical. You throw it in there, spray it in there, in the fire. <laughs> and then um, you also throw salt. We just use regular, regular table salt, right? And we just put it on that thing and throw it in there, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's a set, if you look closely at this sculpture and the one on the table over there in the middle, you can see closely there's speckles on the face that are maybe a slightly different type of mat, but it's, um, that's the salt kind of reacting to the fire and... So this right here, that's the, that's the salt? This, yeah, this one and the other grayish one on the, on the table were in the same firing, but they were in different positions of the kiln. So this one got a lot of salt in her face because you can see it kind of looks like an iron. You see, you can relate. <laughs> and the other one was more towards the back where it got less salt. Um, however, I used a dark brown clay that people haven't really used in a salt fire. And I was like, let me see what happens. And, you know, and it turned gray, which or like a grayish blackish color. Now, for these sculptures, this one and the two on the side, the brown ones, those were in a raku firing. The same type of clay. This is the same clay. The same clay. The same clay. But I threw it in a raku firing, which is, like I said, you know, you fire it up, and then, long story short, you get like a, um, a tin garbage can. You throw some sawdust in there. Throw, not throw the piece, but you put the piece in the, in the sawdust, and it starts going on fire. You got to close the lid and let it sit. So it's really cool, actually. Um, but I was expecting it to be more black and white, but it turned brown. And that's this one. So it was reverse. You thought this was going to be brown, mm -hmm. and you thought this was going to be brown. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that's, that's what I mean. Like, you don't really know what's going to happen, especially if you use materials that people don't typically use. Like, there's, like, a raku clay specifically for raku, but you could also put other clay in there because why not, right? The worst that it's going to do is, like, melt, you know? <laughs> Which is terrifying. sounds terrifying, but... Um, but also, this one is special because I actually put um, mica flakes in it that I found... Actually, I have a rock. Can you hold this, please? I don't know if you guys know what mica is. I don't know if y'all know what mica is. But mica 
is like a, a natural flake that comes from the earth. Where's the rock? <laughs> and, in, an, in another movie. So right, I'm weak. <laughs> so we went to, um, here it is. So we went to the river in North Carolina at the residency. And we saw mica flakes in the sand all over the floor. And they were in like little speckles. And we kind of kept walking. There were, the speckles started getting bigger and bigger. And then I saw a rock. <laughs> and I, it was on the ground. Yeah, it was just sitting there. I mean, it was literally like. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, it's a rock with mica in it. Wow. And you can see the little flakes that kind of like flake off. Well, they don't really flake off. This is the rock, but, but I can actually pass this around if you guys want to see. But those are the flakes that are actually in the piece. And I was like, I wonder what would happen if I put it on top of the, the clay piece and see. And it actually, you see it's silver there, but it actually turned gold. I don't know the chemical reaction of that, so don't ask me. I'm not a scientist. But um, it was really cool. And then some of it kind of flaked off. Once again, it was one of those experiments where I was like, let me try and see what happens. Um, but yeah, that was really fun. And I keep that in my car for memories. I like memories. Yeah, I'm a hoarder, long story short. But <laughs> um, I really enjoyed um, the process. So if you actually smell the smaller sculptures, they smell like fire. That's why y'all probably are like, who is probably smoking in here? Nobody's smoking in here, okay? It's just the raku smell. Impressive. You know who else would be impressed by that? Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that was just a reference. Um, but no, I really, I really enjoy your pieces. Um, I know we we talked about your pieces on a personal um, personal level. I won't get too fully in, involved in that. But I also mentioned to you how your pieces also um, ignited like an alter ego inside of me, where it made it made me it made me it made me feel proud. You know, it's just to stand. Just to stand tall with my chin up, no matter what, no matter what type of space I'm in, um, in a in a multicultural space, a black space, white space, Hispanic space, being grounded in who I am, because I have representation, you know, because I have something to look up to, because I have these monuments, you know. So you being part of that conversation where. You know, for throughout throughout history, we've always seen sculptures of mighty people that has been trailblazers throughout history, for example. But for you to make sculptures for almost almost the everyday person, you know, is to me is is starting is is what art is supposed to be about is the transparency of, of art, you know, the transparency of culture, the tr transparency of thought, you know, the transparency of um, people. Um, and you being, your well, your sculptures being so proud um, in, their, uh, in their figures of, you know, their, uh, how do you say? The representation of what someone that looks like us, you know, having beautiful lips, eyes, ears, cheekbones, ears, all of that. Um, I just think that um, your work does um, magnify and amplify what it means to be yourself, yeah. you know? Um, I also love to, I love that you said that because it means that I'm actually doing what I set out to do. And um, when I talked about making the work more about my own personal self, I feel like that is still okay because usually when we talk about ourselves and we express our feelings, people can also relate to them. And I think that being black, being a black woman, like people can relate to that. And, and really like, even when I sculpt black men, like they still feel seen. And that's what I, I want us to feel seen because we don't we're not seen, yeah. you know, um, and I want us to feel appreciated because we're not appreciated in a way that's not um, in a way that's not 
capitalized off of, you know? And I want us to feel um, celebrated always because we are beautiful people and our culture is beautiful. Um, and how we decide to present ourselves is beautiful regardless. So I definitely want you to, to talk about the spaces that your work is in. Um, we already mentioned the Dela Cruz collection, but please tell us more about uh, what type of spaces that your work, uh, you've seen your work in, um, the type of people who does collect your work, um, where you want to see your work to, to involved in, be more involved in, um, yeah. Um, so my work has been in a lot of different types of places. Um, obviously, love the De La Cruz collection. They're awesome, they're great. Um, I've been in a couple of museums. I mentioned the Baltimore Museum of Art and the Walters Museum. You know, places like Jeffrey Dice, just different. Um, oh, thank you guys. Did you guys like it? <laughs> it's my rock. <laughs> oh, that's what you meant, like Patrick and the, uh, like yeah. having the pet rock. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you meant like living under the rock. And I was like, well, I mean, this would be cool to live under. I don't know. <laughs> Had a moment, my bad. Because um, I was like, it's like my pet rock. Anyways, um, I, I feel a lot of different spaces. So right now I'm actually exhibiting my work at in Baltimore and it is at um, the Bromo Arts Tower which is sponsored by the Baltimore Office of Promotion and Art, BOPA for short. And um, I did this show because I want to show my work, I want my work to be accessible, right? I want us to be able to come and see the work, feel the work, understand the work, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Instead of like walking into an institution and being like, oh my God, like, am I, should I even walk? You know what I mean? I want us to, I want to show in different places where we're comfortable and uncomfortable, right? So even like when I showed at the Walters, it was around Renaissance art. I mean, like the stuff that you see growing up in school field trips. Yeah, it was in the middle of the room and it was a sculpture with of um, the sculpture's name is Dam. Dam. It has like multiple M's and N's. But um, huh? No Kendra Lamar. No Kendra Lamar. I mean, it could be. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, he has he has a, a lock. He has locks in a bun, and he has grills, and his head is tilting back, and he's biting his lip. It's like you know when like your baby looking at you. Hey, man. You know when baby looking at you, and he'd be like biting his lip. He'd be like, ooh, like that was the sculpture, right? In, in the Walters Museum, and people loved it, but it was also relatable to us, right? In a space that is covered in like sculptures of white people, white bodies or by white artists. Um, you have in the middle, literally the middle of the room, a black ass sculpture, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and um, I love, I feel like invading is the wrong word, but I love being in spaces like that. But I also love being in spaces or being collected by people who appreciate the work and who understand why the work is made and understand where they want to put the work and understand why they want to put it in certain places, right? So I love selling to people who see my work and they're like, whoa, I feel this. I'd rather sell to someone like that than someone who's just like, oh yeah, this, this is cool, whatever, I'm gonna just buy it. You know what I mean? Like I want you, because these pieces are a part of my spirit and they should be a part of your spirit, you know? And I want people to actually feel the spirit in them. Um, I want them to, I always say that my pieces have their own personalities, even if they look a little bit alike. I know they look like me, y'all. I know, I'm sorry. But <laughs> even though, even if they look a little bit alike, I want, they all have their own personalities. And, you know, when I did the braided sculpt, the braided hair sculptures, they all have different hairstyles and different colors that kind of contribute to who they are. Because once again, I want us to all be seen as our own people and be accepted as such. Because we're all individuals in our own way. We go through different things. We go through similar things. We all feel different things. We all feel similar things. But we're our own people. So, no, no, it's okay. Um, since they all have their own personality, so they pretty, pretty much all have their own journey, um, who was a female dog? The most difficult. Oh, 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 I was like, ah, oh. damn. Um, I think that, 
I think that that's a hard question. That's a hard question. And it really depends on the series because everybody, I'm like, they're all people in my head. I'm like, everybody has like, everybody had their moment. You know, with Dam, the one I was talking about with the Walters, his neck was breaking, like his neck was about to break. And it was like, his neck was going way too far back. And I was just like, this is so much, I'm about to throw this out. But I'm glad I didn't, because we love Dam. But they all have their own um, issues that I had to work through and be patient with. And that's the other thing with working in ceramics is that I learned a lot of patience. And even in being in the art industry in general, patience. Um, but that's actually a hard question because I always have difficulty with some of them and it's kind of like, and I have to like give them a pep talk. I have to be like, come on girl, like please, just please, please work. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta fire you tomorrow. Just please, just come on, like, <laughs> you know better, like. And then they might act right, they might not. I've actually thrown away a lot of pieces. What was it, when I first moved into uh, my house, I actually broke one of my own sculptures and it was terrible. I was like, I was being so clumsy. I'm clumsy, y'all. I was being so clumsy. And I think it's funny that I'm clumsy and I'm a ceramicist. Like, how can I be clumsy with a whole bunch of breakable art? But um, I was sweeping, and I was sweeping a little too hard for some reason. I ended up moving the carpet. I don't know how that happened, because there was a rug on top of the hardwood floor. I was sweeping the hardwood floor. And I ended up moving the rug somehow, and the sculpture went like, womp, womp, womp. And I was like, no. And then it just, I was like, dude. <laughs> And I was like cursing so hard. My parents ran downstairs and they were just like, are you okay? And they saw it and they were like, oh, we're going to go upstairs. We're just going to leave you. And I was just like, yo. <laughs> but stuff like that happens. Like I don't, I'm connected to all my pieces, but I also understand that they are fragile beings in themselves. And I have to, you know, give respect to that. Some of them break and that's also okay because they had their time. <laughs> So that's really interesting. So do you think when you're creating your your personalities and your sculptures, right? Um, is it a reflection of your your personal journey of your discovering of who you are or discovery of your beauty? Is it is there a direct reflection of of you know your personal journey? So like the feelings that you had or you know feelings that you overcome when you're creating those pieces, do you also experience those feelings as well or is it like a brand new um a brand new moment for you for each each piece um i think that hmm i think that all artists create whatever they're feeling in the moment whether they know it or not if i'm feeling sad that's going to show up in my work whether i realize it or not um just subconsciously but i do think that um over time my thought process has changed. Where before I felt like I was creating for an end product or I was creating for like, um, this is gonna go here, this is gonna go there, and I'm gonna sell this. And But I feel like now I'm in a space where I'm just creating just to create and I'm creating just because it makes me happy and it saved my life and it's, you know what I mean? And I'm, I'm enjoying that aspect to the point where I'm experimenting on things that I've never even, I don't even know what I'm doing, right? But I'm, I realize that I enjoy the process of, I enjoy the journey of learning and getting there. And that makes me feel more connected to my pieces because I actually spent time on you. Like I created you and I feel like we bonded over, I'm talking to you guys if you're my sculpture, but I feel like we bonded over trials and tribulations. I feel like we bonded over like putting you together, you breaking apart, me building you back up. Like we bonded over those things. So I think <laughs> I think that um, my work was like for instance, for example, for example, I love my braided series. I love them. I think they're great. You know, it's personal to me. I hand braid the braids, I dye them, I do all that stuff, right? But after a while, I was just kind of like, you know, I think I'm growing out of this phase of my artistry and I want to do something that's more naked and vulnerable, right? And I, as I'm talking to you, I'm realizing that was my literal personal journey. Like, I had hair 
And then I liked it. And after a while, I felt like I was just keeping it for everybody else, right? And in the artistry, I was, I had these braided pieces. I loved them. And then after a while, I was like, okay, I kind of want to move on, but these is what's paying the bills. You know what I'm saying? And I started to grow out of that. I was just kind of like, mm, I want to do what I want to do. So I even like, right now I have a series up that just is just colored piece, like colorful pieces with um, like mirror paint on them and stuff like that. And I'm experimenting without the braided, the braids all over. Although I love them still. Um, I know, I know, I know. But I also, in that, I also have to understand that I'm growing with my art. And I don't have to forget about them and move on, but I have to understand, like, give myself space to learn, I give myself space to feel and understand myself more. And I felt like I was putting myself in a bubble after a while. Was I answering your question? What was your question? What? At this point, it don't even matter because I, I, because <laughs> I, I, I felt you in every every word, every word that you said. Um, also, um, just a personal journey. I feel like I can definitely relate to you in the moment of you creating your pieces, where you know the, you know you're trying. You have a vision in your head. You're you're trying to create it. It's not going as planned. And but the end result is these beautiful sculptures. And I just feel like for everyone out there. Um, that's a, that's a lesson for me. Like that's something I needed to hear today too, because you already know what's going on. So it's just like everything everything can be chaotic, but it's like the end result. That's what we're that's what we're fighting for. You know, that's what that's why we putting one step forward, one step forward, one step forward, one step forward. You know, I'm also learning that there might. I'm I'm also learning that there might not even be like a end result because what you feel like is the end result might not be the end result or it might not be exactly what you thought it was going to be so yes end result but also open yourself up to all possibilities right yes. yes all possibilities but the thing is is to keep going mm -hmm. you know it's yeah. to keep going Absolutely. you know discover yourself in in that journey mm -hmm. you know because just how knowledge is infinite right mm -hmm. you as this person this body of energy is also infinite. So we will be doing ourselves a dishonor to limit ourselves saying that this is what this is supposed to be and allowing it, allowing yourself to be a witness to the, your own journey is also a beautiful power. That's also something I've been learning, being a witness to my journey. And I feel like a lot of people are chasing control People chase control so much where control is now controlling them. And they just, I think people um, should relax, allow things to be, be a witness to your life. So this is my friend that's talking to me right now. Um, my, she's my friend, and she she knows she she knows me. Um, but uh, what it means to be a witness for me right now is be observant, um, listening to the messages, the patterns, um, the voices of you know what's going around me. And you know what? It, you know what? I'm I'm wrap it up. It's unconditional. It's being a witness is being having unconditional love for yourself and love for everyone else. So it doesn't matter if I'm a brother, a son, a cousin, a best friend, or anything like that. I'm a I'm a person. I mean, well, I'm a medium. My body is the, this medium, and the energy that, that the energy that flows through me is from the cosmics. Even my my voice is from the cosmics. So as a witness to this experience on Earth is knowing that and knowing that I don't owe this body anything but besides respect. So that respect comes from my mind, 
what I say, what I eat, my actions. Um, sorry to take it there, but that's what a witness is. It's like witnessing myself absorb all of the good that's on this earth, all of the good, absorbing that, absorbing, because there's so much stuff that, you know, that can take you somewhere else, but that's not meant for me. And it's like understanding your purpose, understanding your purpose. Once you know your purpose in life, just stick to it. You're not here to be angry. You're not here to be upset. You're not here to do bad things. You're here to do good. You're here to build. And that's what you should witness. It's like how, how there's so much abundance around you and why would you choose not to accept that, yeah. you know? Yeah. So. I, I always tell myself and I always tell my friends that I feel like our bodies are vessels that hold our spirit. So in order to take care of our spirit, we have to nourish our vessels and keep them strong in order to build up our spirit. And with that, I feel like we have to be kind to ourselves sometimes because there's gonna be moments where you're gonna do something and you're not gonna like that you did that thing and you're gonna have to move forward from it, but also like be kind and be forgiving to yourself. I mean, don't, you know, mess up all the time. But <laughs> also, you know, I feel like we live in a day and age where social media has a big part of our brains. Like we scroll all day, we like compare our lives to other people that we see, whether we, Realize it or not, we're comparing. And I think that um, you have to know that everybody's on their own journey and everybody is doing different things and what you see on social media may not always be the reality, right? And I think um, just being kind to yourself is the most important thing. Um, and knowing that you're a human being and you're not, you know, Mr. A plus every day all the time. Sometimes your best is giving C and that's fine, right? <laughs> sometimes your best is giving A and sometimes your best is giving I'm staying in bed. You know, and I think that that's okay but giving yourself grace for those things because when you give yourself grace, you influence yourself to grow. Yeah. Yes, I think it is definitely important to understand because um, life happens. Life be lifing, okay? <laughs> life be lifing. Um, trust me. Um, and that's why I, <laughs> I definitely think it's important um, for, like you said, take it easy on yourself. Take it easy on yourself. Um, it's also, that's also earlier I was mentioning about like my ancestors in my past, like those, those people experienced something that I'd never experienced before, but the, those feelings are still the same. But like knowing that those, that history empowers me because they dreamed of a life that I live, you know, yeah. they dreamed of this life and I'm living it. So yes, always. I walk, when I walk out, every day I walk out of that bed, I show up, you know, <laughs> you know I show up. And I feel like all my friends will, will tell you the same thing. I show up because of, those, because of those experiences that those people experienced before, before me. Um, and that's why I'm just super happy that everyone's here today to experience this with us. So you guys can take it home with you and share it with your, your future selves or whatever. <laughs> um, but yes, like, like we said, no, it's important to understand like if you want to have a, a rest day and be in the bed, be in the bed. You got to do what you want to do. You got to do what you want to do. If you want to be in that bed, that's what you want to do. That's it. That's okay. You don't, you don't need to be scrolling on social media, lo looking at the Kardashians. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and no, it's, a, it's about um, loving who you are. Loving who you are, understanding who you are, um, and amplifying who you are. And that's why we're here. Yeah. We're being brave and contemporary.
Um, oh, you know what I really wanted to understand? Because um, in the t contemporary world, as an artist, um, a lot of artists look at themselves, oh, I went to school, and there's a lot of artists who will say, I didn't go to school. Um, can you, can you uh, talk about what is it like to be um, an educated artist? <laughs> um, sorry, I'm so sorry. Not the Ricks. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <Damn>. Muffle, muffle. <laughs> um, hmm. I think that, so I went to school. I went to college. And it was an interesting experience as a black woman. Now, I'm grateful I got to go because a lot of people are unable to go, right? And I'm very, very grateful that I am able to go. Um, or I was able to go. Um, I did learn a lot. However, do I feel like everybody needs to go? Not necessarily if you feel like that's not your path, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be less successful than somebody else. Because I know a lot of artists who didn't go to college, didn't get their BFA, didn't get their MFA, and they doing way better than I am, right? <laughs> And, but it's like, it's really about like, you know, staying true to yourself and also like getting to know people on a genuine level, not on like an opportunist level, you know? Um, <laughs> um, I'm someone that likes to just build genuine connections with people and have genuine friendships, right? Um, but I think being true to yourself is a big thing. Now, I think that school helped me in certain ways and then I feel, I feel like school didn't help me in certain ways. Um, but once again, I feel like it really depends on the person and their, and their situation. But just because you don't go to school doesn't mean that you're not going to, like, people make it all the time without school. You know what I mean? And that's purely just because of who they are and, you know, the type of work they're bringing out. They could be busting out amazing work. And, you know, they're doing better than so-and-so. They got they. MFA. I don't have my MFA. Um, I was thinking about going to school and getting in. I was like, mm, I don't know. I don't want to go back to school. <laughs> and school's expensive. So it's, you know, once again, it really depends on the situation for each person and if you feel like it's the right path for you. And what have you, what have, what's the most valuable thing you learned outside of school? Mm. Being kind to myself. <laughs> And I think that's, I know I keep talking about being kind to myself because it's something that I'm continuously working on. I'm very, very hard on myself, but I find that when I'm hard on myself, I don't move past a barrier. I just kind of keep, I just kind of keep staying where I am because I'm beating myself up about the same shit every, can I curse? About the same shit every day, right? <laughs> but if I allow myself, forgive myself, allow myself to pivot, allow myself to learn from my failures. And I say failures because I don't like, in quotation marks, because I don't like to really call them failures. They're never really failures, they're just you learn from them. Um, when you learn from them, you clear the, the hurdle. Um, but if you're constantly beating yourself up every day, then it's kind of like you're just making yourself depressed and it's depressing. You know, because you, you know yourself the best. So it's like if the person that you know the best is beating you up, it's like it's no like when the world's already beating you down. They, like, come on. <laughs> like, come on. So I, it's like I have to be the person to bring myself up. You know, I'm grateful to also have a partner who also brings me up. Um, and that's helpful, very helpful when I'm having my days where I'm kind of like, because mm, he's like, girl, get up. We going outside. Like, <laughs> but um, it's, it's, you have to be kind to yourself. And I've learned that just from being around people and surrounding yourself with people who genuinely love and care about you. Surrounding yourself with people who you look up to, right? Because you, you want to constantly learn from, the, yeah, you want to constantly learn from the people that you're around. And birds of a feather flock the fuck together, okay? So <laughs> I always want to be around people who, you know, you don't have to be positive all the time. Like, be real. Like, everybody has their bad days, and that's okay. But, um... <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, you're good, you're good. Um, but, yeah, I'm just learning to surround myself with people that align with me and who always have the thought process of living in abundance, not necessarily in money, but in the sense of your spirit. 
and then um, being kind to myself as well. Well, um, I dropped out of school and I went to the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> so I did, I did a year of college and I was like, this is absolutely not me. I went to the Navy and I was like, this is absolutely not me. <laughs> and I consistently found myself in spaces that I, I excelled in and still not did not want to be in. And I feel like that's always been my journey where I'm like, where I feel like I have great feedback in the areas that I, I'm in. Good grades, good representation in the Navy. None of, the, none of those things matter to me. Um, and I think in my, in my journey, that's a long, which is long, um, I just felt like Nothing was mine. Mm. And I think recently, recently when through my personal life experiences, which you know about, um, I just discovered that, you know what? I just want to be myself. And now I'm here. I think so. I want to be free. And I think... Um, what I the most viable lesson that I learned that I'm responsible for myself. <laughs> Nobody is responsible for me. And I don't think I ever want anybody to be responsible for me. And that's why I think I moved away from having a job. I moved away from being in the Navy. I moved away from being in school because I feel like every time I was in those spaces, I was relying on this institution to take care of me. And I didn't, wasn't really taking care of myself. So I think in my journey right now, it's about just taking care of myself. And also, this is the longest I've ever been single, by the way. Period. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's where I'm on. I'm what Issa Rae said, it's me season. Um, and, but no, but that, but that's probably the most viable lesson I learned was that nobody's gonna come save me. I have to be responsible for myself. I have, and for me to really take care of myself, I have to take on more responsibility. Um, and to be super successful is to maintain it. That's all. Now you got your phone. Okay, they got me. Um, but I definitely, um, I'm definitely love the fact that, um, all of you guys are here today. I am truly honored to have Mashani. Yes! You guys were here. You guys were here. Yes. They were here with us. So let me, so let me, then I'll, before we close out, I definitely want to tell you, um, this is my friend. <laughs> and I thank you so much uh, for the support that you have given me in this time and to be here. She just took, she took the time. She, I told her how much I missed Seattle and being in nature. She was in South Carolina uh, recently, North Carolina. And I was just telling her, sharing things about me and myself. And she just sent me pictures of nature. Sent me videos of nature. It was beautiful out there, y'all. I loved it. Like, it was like, <laughs> it was beautiful. Like, oh, you have to see it, though. Yes. yes. And I'm glad I was able to peek through my phone, you know. <laughs> Technology, well. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, for coming out here. Um, thank you, Shotgun. Thank you, Miami Community Radio, for sponsoring this event for, for me and Majani. And I just really just, I'm, this is a moment for me. And I'm just glad that I have a friend next to me on this couch, honestly. Um, and wait, should we, I, do you guys have any questions? Oh, yeah. 
Wait, do you guys have any questions at all? No questions? Three, two, one. Okay, well, thank you. Um, Can I just say thank you so much? You have been such a gem in my life for the past few years, and I'm so proud of you. Let me tell you, he's been looking out for me, okay? <laughs> Everybody be quiet while she's talking about me. No, you've honestly been looking out for me. You've made this journey like amazing for me and my partner. And you're honestly like, I love the shit out of you. You're amazing. You're amazing. You have such a pure heart. And I'm very, very proud of you because this step is not easy, but you're doing it. And a lot of people have a hard time taking the first step. So very proud of you. Thank you so much. Okay. So I do, I do want to say Melissa Wallen. She was the she was the first person that ignited something in me. Um, Melissa Wallen, which is my director, she's always going to be my director. Um, she's like, Ray, fall into the fold. And I said, OK. And now I'm here. <laughs> so thank you, Melissa. Yeah, and you're filling the, 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 the,